All right, well, this is a uh, provocative title from a provocative person, Nadia Bliss. I've had the pleasure to get to know her just over the last few years. Uh, Dr. Hero has uh, known her for much longer. I was hearing how long just a minute ago. And uh, Nadia is uh, the director of the Global Security Initiative at the Arizona State University. This is a university-wide hub that uh, looks at cybersecurity, health security, and res resource security. And God knows that that's an important topic today. It's centrally important to how we're living our life in the digital economy. There's absolutely no question about it. And you know, it's somewhat like Midas. It has you know, 150 faculty equivalents and nine school uh, units who are, you know, have centers in there, cybersecurity uh, and digital forensic center, human security collaboratory, resilient collective systems, DARPA working groups. Uh, Dr. Bliss is also a professor of practice and is a member of the graduate faculty in the School of Computing, Informatics, and Decision Systems Engineering. She's a su senior sustainability scientist and a Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability. She's in there. She's uh, working in the Center for the Future of War and a lot of other things. Uh, before she came to ASU in uh, 2012, she uh, worked at the Lincoln Labs and uh, worked uh, as a founding group leader of the Computing and Analytics Group. And uh, they had a wide range of sponsors and programs, which included those funded by DARPA, IARPA, ONR, NGA, US Air Force, ASD, r and and many other government sponsors. So I think with that list alone, your credibility is high to come and give the talk, which computer science and fill in the blank, we were trying to figure out how to actually write that down in the program. Better together, the value of an interdisciplinary approach. Nadia, welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? So I, I have a mic. People hear me okay? Yes, great. Um, well, I really want to thank um, Al and Brian for um, inviting me to be here. I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, and thank you for those that are in the audience for sticking around. Um, so when the invitation came, um, I looked in my calendar and it looked like it was my daughter's fall break and we were thinking of going to Disney World, but I figured, you know, what the heck, this is kind of like Disney World. So my daughter's right there. Um, she's going to be here for the talk. <laughs> my mom is there as well. So, um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, I... Um, um, I'll talk a lot more about the Global Security Initiative and kind of what we're doing at ASU, and that's actually what I'd like to really focus on and in sort of an institutional organizational experiment. Um, but I really liked how Daniela this morning started with st statisticians are the original data scientists. So if that's the case, I would say computer scientists kind of set the data science field on fire. And you can, you can take it either way, either bad or good. Um, I am, I'm getting a sense that this is sort of the depressing portion of the symposium, so we're going to get a little bit depressing in the beginning and then hopefully we'll get a little bit more positive uh, towards the end. So um, I, uh, as, as Brian mentioned, I've worked a ton uh, with the Department of Defense and Intelligence community sponsors, so I'd like to kind of put my bottom line up front. Um, basically, what I'd like, the point that I'd like to make is um, really, we need strong collaborations. And it's not just to make things better, but really it's necessary to prevent a lot of the pitfalls that we've now been encountering in this um, Internet of Things, data science rich world. And um, I really do think, again, please bear with me, I am a computer scientist, so of course I would think computer scientists are at the center of it all. Uh, but I kind of see the world as it is today as computer scientists will either save the world or destroy it. So I'd like to, especially, I don't know if those of you have seen the new Blade Runner movie. It's pretty awful. I'd like us not to get there. So let's focus on saving the world. Um, so this is the outline. I'd like to contextualize this a bit. As I said, I'm a computer scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a historian uh, or a humanist, but I'd like to kind of say why um, I'd like to talk about this particular topic. Um, uh, I also would like to make a claim that now is kind of an important time. And there was another important time in the 1960s, which quite frankly, I think we screwed up um, as computer scientists. Um, I wasn't around 1960s, so don't blame me, but um, I think some of us have screwed it up. 
Um, I'd like to say what I think really the challenge is that we're facing today. So why do we actually need to save the world and what's going on? And I certainly will not be able to do it as much justice as uh, Dr. O'Neill. That was a phenomenal, phenomenal talk. Um, if you missed it, you should definitely go watch it. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about issues uh, like algorithmic bias um, and just general um, uh, set of kind of threats and vulnerabilities that we've exposed ourselves to. And then, um, so this is kind of towards the second half of the talk, I'd like to talk about some of the ways we, I, at least I think we can move forward and some of the things we're doing at Arizona State University within my organization, ASU as a whole, um, and also kind of nationally as a computer science community. So with that, uh, let me start a little bit with my background. And um, as, as Brian mentioned, so I, this is, um, the dichotomy here is on purpose. So you have MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which is blue skies and wonderful. And then you have Arizona State University, which has like the devil jumping into the fire. Um, my original transition to ASU was not particularly a happy one. So it was uh, my husband, who uh, Professor Hero Al has worked with for a very long time, was also at Lincoln Laboratory with me. Actually, how many people know about Lincoln Laboratory? Awesome. If you don't know about Lincoln Laboratory, particularly if you're a graduate student, particularly if you're a graduate student in signal processing or computer science, you should definitely go and work there, for sure. It's an awesome, awesome, amazing place. Uh, so it's a federally funded research and development center of the Department of Defense. It does technology in support of national security. So it's a cleared facility uh, that does signal processing, computer science, math, and physics for the Department of Defense. So I spent the first decade of my career there, and I absolutely loved it. It was this beautiful world where you got a complex problem, or maybe a complicated problem is a more accurate um, definition. Uh, and you could work on it, and you could almost immediately see mission impact, which is a very rare type of thing to do. So you were both able to do research and able to transition it to a mission partner. And then my husband, so for those of you who are into career households, uh, probably aware of these kind of challenges, decided that he wanted to be um, a tenured professor and dragged me kicking and screaming across the country to the desert. And quite frankly, I felt like Sparky the Sun Devil at the time, like literally jumping into the fire because I was coming from this clear place of technology, national security, to this place that I knew almost nothing about. So I'm curious, how many people are familiar with what's going on at ASU, kind of broadly, organizationally? Cool, I'll say, uh, I'll say a lot more about that. I think it's pretty awesome. So um, to make the long story short, um, I'm pretty happy at ASU, and I'll tell you more about that as well. So I put this picture here, <coughs> partially for my daughter. So in this picture where I uh, won an Early Career Technical Achievement Award, she was in my belly, um, and she was born literally three days after that picture was taken. So you're uh, actually in that picture. So I've done most of my technical work, um, including my PhD dissertation, um, has been very much in computer science. Um, I've done a lot of publications in high performance computing as well. Uh, the group that I led at MIT Lincoln Laboratory did, <coughs> oversaw all of the HPC for Lincoln Laboratory, high performance computing. Uh, my personal research is analysis of very, very large graphs. Um, I've uh, taken part in a number of discussions as to what's missing in the theory of big data. That picture is from the Santa Fe Institute Science Board meeting. And then when I moved to ASU, I really jumped into interdisciplinary research. And when I first jumped into interdisciplinary research, it, it wasn't quite obvious to me what was going on or why it was important. And I actually found that I was incredibly close-minded coming into it. As a computer scientist, I really didn't appreciate the value of other disciplines when I got to ASU. I know some of you are laughing. You're probably social scientists and are going, duh, of course. Um, but it's, it's actually very interesting, because this is something um, Kathy O'Neill talked about. You're not trained to think about ethics. You're also not trained to think about opinions. As a matter of fact, you're not supposed to talk about your opinions. You just talk about your algorithms, your systems, the performance balance of those algorithms and systems. And I really only had a chance to be exposed to it when I moved over to Arizona State University. So um, I'm, I currently run this interdisciplinary initiative, which spans the entire university. We actually have some very interesting organizational structures, which I'll, which I'll talk about towards the um, uh, second half of the talk. 
Um, I spend some time as an assistant vice president in our Office of Knowledge Enterprise Development. That is essentially what I call our research office on crack. So it is, oversees all of research, like a traditional VPR's office, but also all of economic development, um, all of entrepreneurship and innovation, and many, many other activities. Again, part of ASU's organizational innovation. Uh, I talked a little bit about my Lincoln Laboratory days, and one of the things that I'd like to point out is a lot of these things are kind of newer. What I've really grown an appreciation for is getting involved in things that are pretty much outside of my core discipline. So this appointment as a sustainability scientist is an important one to me. We've heard a talk right before me about the importance of understanding the data and the trends in context of um, changing climate. There's massive amounts of national security implications. So I actually have a, a fellow appointment in New America, which is a DC, actually it's now a national think tank that engages on policy discourse uh, around resource security. And also, uh, starting in July, um, I started my three-year term on the Computing Community Consortium. How many people are familiar with that? Okay, cool. There, are you computer science professors? Yes, yeah. Um, uh, so Kevin Fu at University of Michigan is also on the console, and is a national organization that thinks about audacious futures in computer science, which again, at this point in history, I really feel like computer scientists can really make a tremendous difference, much more so than probably any other time except for maybe that time in 1960s, which I'll come back to. So why now? Uh, what is really happening right now? So before I go to now, let's go back to the 1960s. So those, these guys right here um, on the picture, these are the guys that basically created ARPANET, which was the precursor to the internet. So in 1960s, uh, Department of Defense um, said that they wanted to have computers talk to each other across large geographic spaces. Um, and they asked a bunch of computer scientists, or maybe they were electrical engineers at the time, because computer science wasn't as well defined as a field, uh, to basically build the first set of nodes that talked to each other. And <laughs> this entire team was completely made up of engineers and computer scientists. So here's 25 years later, this is the team that created it. It's also all white dudes, though probably that was okay at that time. I don't know, not acceptable today. And kudos to the Midas organizers for having a bunch of women give talks. Um, so this is, uh, um, this is the picture of that first message being sent. Um, I'm sure those of you who like this kind of stuff, um, I'm very much a geek, I love this sort of stuff. It was uh, two letters, L and O, were sent uh, between two nodes. It was supposed to be login. Uh, it was October 1969, um, so um, however many years ago that was, uh, many years ago, almost 50, I guess. Um, and uh, I would claim that this particular event changed our history. So completely changed our history. So a lot of what was done here really contributed to what we're seeing today with really data science being everywhere, Internet of Things being everywhere, and again, more, more on that in a little bit. So a lot of these challenges that, that are exacerbated by creation of the Internet um, are really challenges that already have been touched on today. And the thing that I've been wondering lately, and my guess is many of you have as well, maybe not, is what would have happened if that original team of these dudes included some humanists, included some ethicists, and um, really at that very, very beginning stage. I mean, they could have added those people later on, but it really would have been nice if that happened in that very, very beginning stage. And I wonder if that team would have been able to anticipate what was going on. I also wonder if that team had kind of the, the training and the background that comes with being a social scientist or a humanist or a science and technology policy person to really engage more vocally in a national discourse on topics of what could internet potentially do. Um, if we would have been able to design, for example, more secure systems. So I've actually written an article on this topic where I said that everything I needed to know about cybersecurity I learned in my master's class at Cornell University almost 20 years ago. 
So it's not, a lot of the things that we're seeing today are often due to the lack of accountability and lack of engagement between the computer science community and many other communities. Um, so the internet, 1969, it was just a couple nodes communicating together, now it's everywhere. Uh, this is just a collection of a bunch of different items. We all have a smartphone, I imagine, in this room. But it's not just, it's not just our phones. It's our thermostats, it our, it's our refrigerators, everything is collecting data, um, uh, our Fitbits. And while all of this is presenting tremendous opportunity, it also creates massive amount of vulnerability and potentially also um, we're innovating at a very fast rate without necessarily pausing and thinking, what should we really be doing? And I'm sure all of you have seen these exponential type of charts where the number of internet connected devices is, is growing and the number of data is, is growing exponentially as well. So, so why is this challenging? Why, um, and we've touched a little bit on this today, and certainly Kathy's keynote touched on this quite a bit. Um, but I would, again, uh, like to make these two points. And they're pretty reductionist, and they're pretty simple. But I see them as really the cause of the big challenges that we see. So one is the ignoring the human user, and the other is ignoring the human creator. And I won't talk too much about ignoring the human curator, creator, I think that's actually a lot of where the algorithm bias comes from. Um, one thing I will say is that I, I, would, I would claim that the algorithms are not biased. It's the data and the parameters and the heuristics that create them that are. Um, computers do basically exactly what you tell them. And um, if you tell them the wrong thing, they're going to do the wrong thing. Ignoring the human user is the other one. So um, I was actually fascinated by the, the talk right before me. Um, I've, I spent the last couple years working much more closely with the sustainability and climate research community, and I'm baffled by the fact that there's still a debate on the topic. Um, and I think sometimes, as people who build models and people who build algorithms, we forget that there's a human user at the end of this. And I, I'd like to pause here and tell a bit of an anecdote. So um, I've, uh, as I mentioned, I spend a long time working with the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. So I've had the honor to be on a number of analyst floors. Um, for those of you who've never been on one, it's basically a floor with a bunch of computer screens and people doing things, which I can't tell you anything about. But what's fascinating about that is that you have these people who are working who have amazing, amazing domain knowledge. I mean, these are people that have been um, on the ground in countries. They really understand the problem. And they get these tools that you know, fundamentally are not useful to them. And then they shut them down, and they open up Excel, which I think is kind of heartbreaking and devastating for both sides. Because if I build a really cool tool, I want it to be used. And I really don't want this amazing person wasting their time with Excel. Not that Excel is bad. I'm sorry, Microsoft. Um, so, <laughs> so Excel is great for whatever it's worth. Um, so I wanted to just um, highlight a couple of things here, which I think um, it certainly have helped me think about these two, um, two problems, sort of ignoring the human user and ignoring the human creator. So I'll start with the ignoring the human user. So this is, um, this is a result um, that I've learned from the social science literature. Um, there's a number of different frameworks for how to make effective computational and decision tools. Um, but this is one that a lot of the folks that I work with uh, directly use. Uh, Professor White is one of the um, global security fellows um, in my institute. And then I believe the original paper on the topic actually came out of Harvard. It's Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. So basically says that for decisional and computational tools to be effective by linking scientific knowledge to decision making, you need these three things. Saliency, credibility, and legitimacy. So what, is, what are these three things? So credibility are all the things that computer scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, physicists think about. There are, are, is our data correct? Are equations correct? Have we used the right models? So we tend to be pretty good with that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, that's what I've spent the first 10 years of my career working on in the space of credibility. Saliency um, gets a little bit fuzzier. So saliency really talks to, are you presenting to the user what the user needs to see? So you know, if you are um, a farmer in Iowa and I'm showing you um, 
levels of water rise in Florida, probably not very salient, even though highly credible information. Legitimacy, on the other hand, is basically have you taken into account the diversity of um, beliefs and perceptions in the room? So this thing is I personally have very hard time with. As I said, I'm a computer scientist. I'm sort of an engineer, kind of classically trained engineer. And it's hard to think about opinions because we like to think, well, decisions are just based on data and fact, but they're actually very much influenced by belief systems. So um, uh, Elle would probably recognize this. In MIT Lincoln Laboratory fashion, I have a stoplight chart on top of that. So I would claim we do reasonably OK with credibility. It's not green. Um, and it's not green, basically, because we still build in biases into our systems. Uh, we're kind of yellow on saliency. Um, and then we really, most of the time, completely ign ignore legitimacy. So if we go to that second point of ignoring the human creator, um, there are no equations here. And probably the computer scientists in the room are going to be screaming because this is really reductionist pers uh, perspective. Um, but I've thought a lot about this. So why are we building in this inherent algorithmic bias? So um, I would claim that a lot of the tools, a lot of the data science tools that are built into these systems, such as recommender systems, assess assessment systems, optimization systems, um, in Daniela's talk, uh, Professor Witten, she talked a lot about um, kind of non-tractable problems. So a lot of the times these problems fall into the class of non-tractable or NP-complete. So essentially problems that do not have solutions that can be exact solutions that can be found within a polynomial time, basically reasonable running time. So if you don't want to sit in front of your computer for weeks or days or years, you're going to build an approximation. You're going to build an approximation algorithm. If you're building an approximation algorithm, that requires some sort of heuristic. And if you're building in a heuristic, you're almost guaranteed to build in some sort of bias system. So uh, moving kind of forward on this, um, these are, again, each one of these could be topics of separate talks. But they're essentially these two big issues that we, as computer scientists, tend for the most part to ignore and continue to innovate and build these continuously innovative systems that collect the data and that connect to each other and build networks, et cetera. Um, so basically what I'm saying is computer, computer science and technology is not enough. We have built in these disciplinary silos, which exacerbate the, the problem. And um, at this point, I'd like to actually um, kind of credit Midas quite a bit uh, because what I've seen here today all day is there's this huge commitment to interdisciplinarity here. And uh, what I can say from my personal experience from doing exactly this kind of thing is interdisciplinary is incredibly easy to say. Everybody is saying they're doing interdisciplinary, but it is incredibly difficult to do. It is very difficult to do true interdisciplinary research where you don't just have a token computational scientist on a social science project or a token ethicist on an algorithm project. So it's a, it's a very challenging problem. So what are we doing? So here, if you allow me to kind of step back and uh, brag a bit about ASU, um, I feel like I very much should do that, especially since I talked about like it was jumping into hell with Sparky. Um, I'd like to take a little bit of time to kind of walk you as to what we're doing in our institute um, wh and why I think what we're doing is working. Oops. Maybe it's working, maybe not. Um, so ASU has gone, uh, so I saw a couple of hands go up. ASU has gone through this massive transformation in the last 15 years or so. So in 2002, uh, President Michael Crow uh, left Columbia University as an executive vice provost and basically came to a sleepy party school in the desert. Um, I will say we haven't been on that party school list for probably at least a few years, which uh, we internally celebrate all the time. The students may not, uh, but, but we do. Um, and he came to ASU with this idea of fundamentally transforming higher education. And again, I'll be a little bit reductionist here, but the way that I sort of think about it is there are two tenets to transforming education as President Crow has defined. So one is accessible, high quality education. So basically saying if you're qualified to get a college degree, you should get one. We will accept you. That doesn't mean we, don't, we accept anybody, but if someone is qualified to get a college degree, we accept them. The second one is advancing research and discovery of public value. So there's a huge emphasis 
on kind of solution-focused research initiatives at Arizona State University. We do a ton of basic research that's curiosity-driven, but there is sort of no shame in doing things that have a direct application. So to support this mission and this charter, and the other thing that's kind of interesting, so for those of you that are familiar with Arizona, when you think Arizona universities, you probably think U of A. Um, this is actually, so the charter has been around less than, so I've been at ASU for five years and it's been around for less than five years. I think it's only been around for about two years uh, because ASU formally didn't have a charter. So this is our, um, uh, this is our pretty new charter. So the way that we are structured is um, slightly different than um, a lot of other universities. So we have this notion of knowledge enterprise, and then there's the office of the president, and then this is where it gets a little bit different. So we have an executive vice president, that's the provost, pretty traditional, oversees the academic sides, or oversees the educational access mission, and then we have this other executive vice president of knowledge enterprise development. So in a lot of universities, for those of you who kind of understand the university structure and are interested, are organizational nerds like me, um, the knowledge enterprise development person actually reports up to the president through the provost. Here, we've actually explicitly broken it up. So we're basically given these major challenges its own line, direct, their own line directly to the president. And then uh, under that, you kind of see, you know, there's colleges and deans reporting to the provost, pretty traditional, how it is in other universities. And then there are these major institute initiatives that report through this other executive vice president. So what it does, I often get a question of, you know, where, where does my institute live? Does it live in um, engineering? Does it live in College of Liberal Arts and Sciences? And the answer to that is no. It's a pan-university initiative, and it's truly pan-university, with the reporting line directly to an executive vice president that is an equal to the provost and also reports to the president. And that actually, while it seems like kind of weird org charting thing, actually makes a huge difference. So um, we are a university-wide interdisciplinary hub for global security research. There are three institutes that are at this president's office level. Um, there's the Biodesign Institute, there's the Global Institute of Sustainability, and then the security one. Um, so just, I guess I would uh, point out that we do not have a building. If somebody would like to give me a building, I would totally take a building. Uh, we, have a, we have a floor of a building um, in this actually very nice one that was built in uh, 2012. Um, so we have about, actually it's 170 affiliate faculty at this point. Um, I track very closely what is the percentage and breakdown of that faculty. So I actually, one of my internal performance measures, so coming back interdisciplinary is hard, especially when I myself am an engineer and it's very easy for me to default uh, to engineering, is we actually track what percentage of our faculty and faculty engagement comes from various college level units. And you can see engineering certainly has a big component, but it's not actually the majority of our faculty. And we have faculty in dance that work with us. I'll actually say a bit more about them later. I am um, very conscious of my pronouns after Jamie's talk this morning. So I will refer to everybody by name. I will not say he or she. So this is another thing that kind of ties back to my initial um, premise. Almost everything we do has a significant computer science component. Why? Because computer science at the moment permeates absolutely everything, but nothing we do is computer science alone. And that's incredibly important. So that's something that, again, we watch and we work very, very hard at. And I'll kind of come back to, again, you'll probably think they're reductionist, but I'll come back to my um, sets of principles as to how we do this towards the very end. So these are the areas that we work in. Uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, we work in these borderless domains. Um, so my institute focuses on things that basically do not respect geographic boundaries. Things like cybersecurity, health security, economic security has become increasingly more and more important. Essentially what happens as a lot of the workforce gets automated. Um, resource security is another important area. And then we have these capability areas that we focus on. So robotics and autonomy and teaming, human and social conditions, uh, decision making and analytics. 
So I talk a little bit about these challenges. So I'd like to just kind of highlight which ones address which. So we have a human security collaboratory, and I have a slide on each of these coming up. I'll, I'll, I know everybody's waiting uh, for Kathy and Neil to come back for questions, so I'll kind of go, go through it fast. But we basically have, we have an effort kind of focusing on all of these challenge areas that I've mentioned in the very beginning. So we have a human security collaboratory that is co-led uh, by uh, Professor Jackie Warnament and Professor Jessica Roshko um, that's focused on essentially how do we manage our existence and ethics and civil rights and democracy within this digital world that's very much a human security issue. You may not think of it as a traditional sort of Pentagon-like security issue, but it is very much a security issue. We have a Center for Cybersecurity and Digital Forensics where we think about uh, data vulnerabilities and ransomware. We have initiatives looking at uh, narrative structure and how information spreads. So a little bit about <laughs> each of our centers. Um, and again, the way that we think about centers um, is actually also a bit different. So I mentioned in my abstract that I will talk a little bit about organizational design. So none of our centers are a single faculty and his or her students. All of our centers have a requirement to have multiple faculty. And when I say multiple, it's on the order of 40 or 60. And they have to have um, a significant mission focus. So for us, that mission, of course, is security. So the way the center is structured, we work in the areas of education, research, and entrepreneurship, all three of those areas. So we engage on the academic side. There's actually a very exciting thing that happened recently is um, our, um, uh, one of our educational committees approved an inclusion of a computer security course as a requirement for all computer science majors. I actually think that it's kind of amazing that until now, a lot of computer science degrees actually did not require um, a security course. Um, and again, so if you look at how the center is structured, it's 40 affiliates from 10 academic units. We work very closely with our industry partners, and we also work on spinning out uh, companies, a number of which have actually recently won a bunch of awards. So I always like to put up people on the slide. I guess that's because I'm a woman, according to Jamie. Um, I think lots of people uh, do the work. Um, so these are the 40 faculty members or so. I can't count. It's probably more than that. Um, that are in our center, and there's a whole bunch of them that are computer scientists, but there's some that are psychologists, that are some that come from the business school, some that come from the law school, and they all work very closely together. Oops, and these are just some of our partners. I'm running out of time. Um, so we just recently stood up a center for human um, AI, artificial intelligence, and robotics te robotic teaming. So there's a lot of people that study robots, there's a lot of people uh, that study swarms of robots. There's a lot of people that study teaming. We decided to bring it all together because ultimately I think what's going to happen is, um, so I think it's unrealistic to say that automated systems are not going to be part of teams. They already are consistently all the time. Uh, so understanding how team dynamics, team efficiency, uh, team tasking um, actually changes with composition of the teams uh, is incredibly important. So this center is actually being led by an applied psychologist with, uh, again, strong participation from computer science, um, mechanical engineering, and many other disciplines. So you can see some of the examples. I feel like you have to put swarms of robots um, on a slide if you're talking about robots. And that's actually Professor Nancy Cook, who is the lead. And she recently just won um, a Murray Award looking at how um, attackers, cyber attackers uh, think. I mentioned this to um, Al yesterday. So we just recently have been notified that we are now the newest Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence. Um, the, so our Center of Excellence is um, Center for Accelerating Operational Efficiency. Department of Homeland Security has about 10 or so of these centers active at a given time. Um, these are incredibly tight and strong partnerships with the Homeland Security Enterprise focused on a sustained relationship. So um, uh, this, uh, the way the centers are structured, they're a five-year cooperative agreement with a potential for another five years uh, with a potential of up to $40 million in funding over those, uh, over those 10 years. So we're very excited about that, particularly because we get to work very closely with our mission partners. So I talked a lot about that engagement. 
engagement across disciplines and engagement with mission partners. This is really, the goal of this center is to work really closely with the Homeland Security Enterprise and bring all the data science, analytics, and optimization, it's predominantly analytics and optimization center, uh, to kind of um, identify how to make the operation of the Department of Homeland Security Enterprise better. Um, and more efficient. Um, so, uh, for example, one of the uh, one of the components we're likely to work with is um, TSA, Transportation Security Administration, and to see uh, what we can do about things like, for example, officer fatigue. Um, and then I mentioned this. I think this is probably um, one of the most surprising successes, in my opinion, to me. And again, this is my closed-mindedness as a computer scientist coming through. Um, so we have this really awesome effort called the Human Security Collaboratory. And what you see here, so Professor Jessica Roshko, she's actually a dance professor. Um, what they do is they build these installations. So Professor Jessica Roshko with Professor Jackie Mornemund co-lead this effort. They build these installations where they create these essentially works of art, and then they put haptic devices in these works of art. So when you go visit them, what happens is that, in this case, the net, actually vibrates as you're shedding data, which is a, an incredibly different experience than just knowing how much data you're communicating from various devices. So you actually get to feel and experience what it really means to live in this type of environment. Um, and they also did an installation with scul sculptures where you could climb on top of the sculptures. So, and again, I'm really apologizing to my daughter. This is a bad word. Um, I uh, don't read it. She's ignoring me. She's watching her iPad, so it's all good. Um, so some of the things that um, I've learned about interdisciplinary research. Um, I was actually at a, a AAAS meeting, and the discussion was specifically about interdisciplinary research, and somebody said what you need is space and funding. And I actually think that was an incredibly insightful observation because that is kind of the minimum. That's a necessary condition of what you need because ultimately it comes down to people working together and to be able to do that, you really need both space and funding, which is why I think what Al and Brian have, have done is really amazing. But I also think you need these two other things. So one is patience. It's, um, it's very easy for me to really quickly go write a MATLAB script that is gonna run some sort of optimization. It is much harder for me to go meet with like 10 different people in social science and humanities and talk to them about all of the issues they may think I may have with my data or potential bias in my data or potential vulnerabilities in my data. And um, a lot of the times, unless there is that time commitment on both sides, interdisciplinary just becomes something people say. They put this label um, on top of it is whatever they're doing. And we do very, um, very strongly comply to the no a-hole rule um, <coughs> at GSI. Um, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with this book. How many people are familiar? Oh, good. I like to see the hands up. Uh, so Professor Sutton is a professor at Stanford, um, I think in engineering management science. I actually read this book back when I was at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. He wrote it in context of a faculty search. Um, so he actually wrote it in context of academia that they were interviewing someone for a position and this person looked amazing on paper, but the negative cost to um, the team dynamics was going to be too high and they decided not to hire him. And there's many studies that basically say that, you know, for one negative interaction, you need five positive interactions to balance it out, which kind of explains why I vent so much to my husband when I come home. Um, and we work very hard on putting these teams together. So often, you know, somebody will come back to me and say, why didn't you include so-and-so person? And I'm like, well, because everybody hates so-and-so person. So so-and-so person is not going to be on our team. Um, and I think as an interdisciplinary institute, we actually get an opportunity to pick and choose who we work with, uh, which I think is a tremendous luxury. Um, one of the things that I was just going to wrap up with um, is I mentioned the Computing Community Consortium. It's an awesome organization, so I've been aware of it um, probably as long since its inception, which is more than 10 years ago. Uh, but it's basically a national organization um, of computer scientists, uh, pretty senior computer scientists, a number of them are, are, are deans. Um, there's a dean of Cornell Computing, the dean of University of Maryland, and then some weirdos like myself. 
uh, to basically think about and catalyze and bring really, really smart people together to discuss the future of computer science. And I think that the, what this organization does is um, more important now than ever. Um, there's a lot of engagement with um, congressional representatives, a lot of policy dialogue. Uh, there's going to be a symposium on the 24th that essentially brings together agency representatives. Um, it's funded by NSF. It's part of the Computing Research Association. Um, I think I will wrap up with this, except actually, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll mention. Uh, so from a, from a goals perspective of the CCC, so I've talked about a lot of this in context of this entire talk. Um, but one of the things that I'll say I think is actually really important is this notion of um, focusing on leadership. I think one of the things that's been missing in the computer science community is kind of a loud voice. So I think that if if we've been a little bit more vocal, um, I mean, as I mentioned, cybersecurity is a prime example. Um, and I think there's a lot of very concrete things we can do. Um, I mean, I think an approximation algorithm focus area that minimizes bias is a really great government investment. Uh, so there's a lot of very technical things that we can do, but that require engagement uh, with the broader community. So I'm very proud to be um, part of them. So. Um, with that, I think I'm going to wrap up. I think I'm pretty much out of time. Um, I, I guess what I would say is, for those of you in the audience who are computer scientists where there weren't that many, just go out and talk to some people that are not computer scientists. And if that person happens to be a policymaker, that's even better. But you can talk to anybody. Just talk to anybody that's not a computer scientist. And if you are not a computer scientist, go find a computer scientist and become friends with them. And, um, make sure that you identify some ways to collaborate. And again, I just want to thank everybody for their time, um, and I appreciate the invitation.